Let us pray together. Come, Holy Spirit. We need your help to hear the message God has for us today. And we need your help in applying it in our lives. We believe that you have been given to us, Holy Spirit, to transform our lives into fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we cooperate with you in that process, and sometimes we resist. Move in our hearts today so that we will cooperate with you more fully. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, who loved us so much he died on the cross for us, and then rose in victory over sin and death to offer us new life through faith in him. May we now live that life in his name and for his glory. Amen. I am not the one who is always on the cutting edge of the latest technology. I was about the last person I know to get a cell phone. And I only learned how to send text messages because my friends kept sending me text messages. And so I am sure that it does not surprise you to hear that I was one of the last of my friends to get a smartphone. And I probably would not have a smartphone now, except for that my friends kept telling me how much I needed one. For over a year, several of my friends told me again and again how much better my life would be if only I would get an iPhone. They showed me all of the things that they could do on their iPhone that I could not do on my old phone. One told me that we could play words with friends, but I really don't like to play games. <laughs> One told me that I can check email and Facebook on an iPhone, but I could do that on my computer. One told me that I could have access to weather reports when it was stormy. I can do that on the TV and the radio. One told me that we, when we talk on the phone, we could have FaceTime. And it has never been necessary for me to see who I was talking to on the phone before, so why now? As you can see, it went back and forth for over a year. My friends did everything they could to convince me that because they loved their iPhones, I would love to have an iPhone too. Well, after a year, they wore me down, and yes, I bought an iPhone last January. And yes, I enjoy the things it allows me to do that I could not do on my old phone, but I probably would not have an iPhone now if it weren't for my friends who were so eager to tell me how much they loved theirs and how much I needed one too. So I got to thinking, what would happen if we were as comfortable and as excited about sharing our relationship with Jesus Christ as we are about telling others about our iPhones. At the risk of having many of you stop listening, I'm going to say the word anyway, evangelism. Now, I know that for most of us, including me, that word brings to mind a way of confronting and manipulating people to get saved that is uncomfortable. And while we know that we should share our faith, most of us do not feel comfortable doing it that way, you know, being an evangelist. Most of us are not comfortable going up to strangers and asking them if they are saved and then trying to lead them to be saved. And that's what we think of when we hear the word evangelism. But I'm here to tell you that evangelism is a good word with a bad reputation. The word evangelism comes from the root word meaning good news. An evangelist is simply a person who shares good news. So think about it. When was the last time you had some good news to share? When did you see a movie or read a book you enjoyed so much that you could not wait to tell someone about it? You know, that is why I read at least 
three of the books that I've read in the last few years, well, books that were not directly related to ministry, because people kept recommending to them these books to me. One was The Shack, one was Same Kind of Different as Me, and one was The Help. People kept asking me if I had read them and telling me that I should. And you know what? After I read each of these books, I went around telling my friends and family that they should read them too. I even bought copies and gave them to people that I thought would enjoy them. Sharing good news. It's not that hard. When have you had a good meal at a new restaurant and you couldn't wait to take a friend there to enjoy it too? You know, many of you have taken me to Liao's for great meals. And since my sister loves Mexican food and rarely gets to eat it since she lives in Ohio, the first thing we did when she came to Mule Shoot was go to Lee Owls to eat. Before she even came to my house, we went to Lee Owls <laughs> to eat. It's not hard to share good news. When did you experience love so deep? and grace so life-changing that your first response was to invite someone else to experience it. When we have good news about most things, we want to share it with others. We want to invite someone else to experience what we have experienced. That's evangelism. Though we don't use that word because we don't like that word. But in today's world, the kind of evangelism that works is the kind that is a natural friend-to-friend -friend conversation, much like the way we tell one friend about an iPhone or another friend about a good book or maybe about a favorite restaurant or maybe tell someone the good news that someone we know has come through surgery for a lung transplant and is doing well. Or the good news that a new grandbaby has been born. Or that someone is going to be grandparents to triplets. Good news is easy to share. In his sermon, the character of a Methodist, John Wesley declared that Methodists do good to all people in every way they can. He went on to make it very clear that this included but went beyond meeting their physical needs for food and clothing. It meant that Methodists do good to their souls by inviting them to experience the love of God in Christ and by encouraging those who have experienced that love to continue to grow in their discipleship. You see, for Methodists, sharing the good news means more than simply getting someone saved. Sharing the good news of Christ involves inviting people to have their lives transformed into fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ so that they can live the abundant life that Jesus offers us. Peter Story, a retired United Methodist bishop from South Africa, wrote that it was said of the early Methodists that anyone who worked beside them in a factory or in a coal mine was always at risk of getting converted because the Methodists were so clear about the need for Christ in every life. Story went on to ask, would that be true of us today? Are we clear about the need for Christ in every life? And are those who work alongside of us in danger, at risk of being converted because we are constantly telling them how excited we are about our relationship with Jesus Christ? In 2008, the General Conference of the United Methodist Church added the word witness to our membership vows. Our membership vows are 
to participate in the ministries of the church through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. In addition, the addition of the word witness reminds us that each of us is called to be a witness to others of how the Holy Spirit is transforming our life into, fully devoted, into a fully devoted disciple of Jesus Christ. We are witnesses by the way that we live and by the way that we tell others the good news about Jesus Christ and how he makes a difference in our life. Now, I realize the idea that we are expected to be a witness for Jesus Christ by sharing our testimony is almost as uncomfortable for many of us as the word evangelism. I think this is because we imagine it to be much harder than it really is. You see, I'm not suggesting that you stand on the street corner and tell the entire story of your life, including every sin and how you repented of it and received forgiveness. I'm also not suggesting that you have to quote a scripture verse to prove everything that you might say about Jesus and what it means to follow him. Now, it is certainly helpful to know what the Bible says and how it relates to your life, but not knowing the exact verse and where it is found in the Bible should never keep you from sharing what Christ means to you. Being a witness for Jesus Christ simply means being willing and able to share with someone what Jesus means to you. How your faith in Christ makes your life better. How you have experienced Christ's presence, his love, his grace. Your witness is simply what you have experienced in your relationship with the Lord. And if you can tell it in plain, simple words... That would be great. After all, that was the approach that Jesus and the first disciples followed. They used plain, simple words to invite others to follow Jesus. Let's read about it in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 35 through 46. Our passage for today, John 1, 35 through 46. And if you're using the Pew Bible, the passage is found on page 1647. If you'd like to follow along in the Bible, or the words will also be on the screen. The Gospel of John, chapter 1 starting with verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the 10th hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. 
Come and see, said Philip. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Now, the John in the first verse is John the Baptist, not John the Apostle, but John the Baptist, who also had disciples who followed him. John was a great prophet of God, but he knew that Jesus was the one they had all been waiting for, the one that he had prepared the way for. God had shown John that Jesus is the Son of God, and so when he saw Jesus passing by, he said to his disciples, Look, the Lamb of God. In other words, John told his disciples that Jesus was the one that they had been waiting for, the one that they should follow. John was a witness to his disciples that they should follow Jesus instead of him. Notice that what he said was short and simple. Now, he could have quoted Old Testament scriptures all day about the Messiah, but instead he simply said, Look, there he is, the one from God, the one you have been waiting for. You should follow him. When these two men started following Jesus, he turned around and asked, What do you want? Notice that Jesus did not start preaching to them. He only asked them a question. And the answer was, Rabbi, where are you staying? In other words, they acknowledged him as a teacher and indicated their desire to spend time with him so that they could learn from him. In response, Jesus did not give them a long lecture. He simply said, if you want to spend time with me, come on. After spending a short time with Jesus, one of these two, Andrew, went and found his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah. Andrew was a witness to Simon, but again, he did not tell a long story. He simply said, we believe we have found the Messiah. Come with me to meet him and see if you agree. And Simon went with him. The next day, Jesus found Philip and simply said to him, follow me. And Philip then found Nathanael and told him in his own words about Jesus. Well, Nathanael doubted that Jesus could be who Philip thought he was, but Philip did not argue or try to prove his point. He simply said, come and see. In other words, Philip said, I believe Jesus is someone very special, and I think that if you get to know him, you will think so too. Why don't you come and see for yourself? In this passage, notice how many different people share the good news. Notice that they didn't wait until they had all of the answers. They didn't wait until they had a speech prepared. They didn't have to memorize any scriptures. They were simply excited about what they had experienced in their time with Jesus, and they wanted the people that they knew and cared about to have the opportunity to get to know Jesus too. This is what it means to be a witness. We are called to be witnesses about our own relationship with Jesus Christ because every person in the world needs Jesus Christ. And there are a bunch of people in the world who do not know him yet. If we know him, then the loving thing for us to do is to share the good news of his love and grace with others. Doing this does not have to be difficult. It should be natural and loving, honest, and authentic. It usually starts with friendship or perhaps some effort to show concern for someone who seems to be struggling. When your path crosses someone who needs to hear about Jesus, often the best place to start is by listening to the other person's story or problem, or questions. Once you know what is on their mind, you will have a better idea of how to share the good news with them. It could be as simple as telling someone that when you have experienced the kind of hopelessness that they are feeling, you have found hope through prayer. Or 
When you have questions about God's love, you read the story of Jesus in the Gospels. Or when you feel alone, you find comfort and support from your Sunday school class or from attending worship. Remember, the role of a witness is not to argue the case or to judge the outcome, but simply to tell what they heard, saw, or experienced. Can you tell the story of your relationship with Jesus in simple, and clear, and concise way? If not, maybe you can practice doing so with your family or your Sunday school class or your small group. One way to begin is by answering the question, where or how have you experienced God at work in your life recently? Where or how have you experienced God at work in your life recently? Asking and answering this question, or others like it, with fellow disciples that you are comfortable talking about your faith with, will help you prepare to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others when the opportunity presents itself. After all, you do know how to share good news. You do it all the time. If you can tell someone about a book or a movie or an iPhone, then you can also tell them about how knowing Jesus makes your life better. Because no matter how great having an iPhone is, it certainly cannot compare to the difference having Jesus in your life means. That is the best news ever. So let's learn how to share this good news with others who need to hear it. Amen.